Uh, hello again. Uh, we are recording and I am going to just go ahead and turn things over to Stacy and Kathleen. Thank you both so much. Again, if anyone has any questions, please do put those in the chat and I will keep an eye on it. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to be here and talk a little bit about our collections of distinction. Um, I'm Kathleen McCarty Smith. I am the department head at Special Collections and University Archives and associate professor. And this is my esteemed colleague, Stacy Crum, curator of manuscripts and cello music. Okay, I'm going to share the link to our homepage in chat for you. I'll be sharing links in chat throughout the presentation. Okay, so again, we're the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives, or for short, SCUA. Um, we actually formally began in 1972 um, when we we kind of opened and and started developing collections of rare materials really with the with the intent of supporting research and instruction departments um, at the college i uh, just wanted to mention i'm going to do a shameless plug and tell us tell you that our reading room is open from monday through friday nine to four and that is when jackson library is open we have um, an extensive uh, website which you see kind of on on the right there um, where we have information about the department Department, about the collections, finding aids, digitized collections, and exhibits. And here is the, the mission of our, our department. Um, we serve not only the university community, but also the community at large. So we serve researchers worldwide, um, and we take this mission very seriously. We're here not only to collect materials and preserve them, but also to make them as excessive as possible. So we're thinking pretty broad terms in terms of not only having people come in, um, but also recognizing that not everyone in the world can travel to wonderful Greensboro, North Carolina. So we're very committed to working and collaborating with our digital digitization department, um, and also to bring our materials out into the community at, uh, in Greensboro and in Guilford County. So that way, as many people as possible have the opportunities to experience this collection. So um, we're going to talk a lot about stuff today, and that really is the fun. That's the fun part of special collections. But we do a lot of things with the stuff we just want you to be aware of. Um, so this is what we're doing uh, when we're not hoarding, when we're not behind the seeds hoarding, preserving, or out collecting the material. Um, as I said, we want to make certain this gets into people's hands. We're not an archive that likes to see um, dust accumulating on the boxes on the shelves. We want to make certain things have a life outside of the closed stacks. So we do a lot of work to make certain that happens. So a lot of uh, people do ask us why why we collect. What is the purpose of special collections and university archives? And it's really to preserve, to collect and preserve material um, of enduring value. And this is not only for current researchers, but also future future researchers. Which we also we always have to keep in mind when we are collecting not only what is what would be uh, you know applicable now, but also in the future. But you know, importantly, we are the the repository for primary sources, uh, which is is really important. Probably even more important now with the with the um, prevalence of fake news. Uh, that it's really showing that it's important for researchers and students, of course, to to be able to access primary source material, which gives them different perspectives from their own in interpreting interpreting events, and allows them to quickly and um, analyze these primary sources for research and writing. OK, our curatorial um, strengths include uh, UNCG history, of course, local and regional history, which is, is fairly new to us, creative writing, visual and performing arts, and women's history. So today we're going to talk about kind of collections of distinction is how we're phrasing this, which really is kind of supports our mission and, um, and research instruction and outreach. And you'll kind of see how that happens. OK, 
So we started our, our school as the State Normal and Industrial School, which is now, of course, UNCG. It was founded in actually 1891, opened its doors in 1892. When it opened, it was a segregated all-girls school, and it was a public school. Um, so it was paid for for tax dollars, which was rather unique at the time. And it really focused on educating young women to become teachers. So it taught pedagogy, thus a normal school. Um, it was desegregated in 1956-1957 school year and became co-educational in 1963. Three. So really one of the things that especially University Archives does, but really it kind of goes across collections, is to document the history of the campus. Um, and this is across University Archives, manuscripts, rare books, cello music collection, and women's uh, women veterans project. I wanted just to point out this adorable little picture on the screen. This is a little charm bracelet in our artifact collection when the school was named the Women Col Women's College of UNC, um, UN the UNC system. And we have a lot of these wonderful artifacts that, ref that reflect um, the history of, of the school. Okay, so I want to talk about University Archives for a minute because we kind of throw that term around to, to really be, you know, kind of represent all of SCUA. But the University Archives is really, is really um, the part of SCUA that that collects the material that was gen that is has been generated by the university. So this includes the official records of the school. Um, we have a record retention policy, and we were we are actually uh, required by the state to collect documents from the departments, from the chancellor's office. So we do that, but we also collect material that reflects student life and culture. And this can include anything from campus publications, yearbooks, um, anything like that. Most of that is, is digitized and online, luckily. Artifacts, ephemera, historical photographs, oral histories, which are really great primary sources. We use those a lot in classes. Um, anything that reflects the campus social or political movements. Um, quite a lot of material that reflect the student culture. And people ask, how do we get this material for University Archives? Most of it is transferred from different departments or different offices on campus. But we also get uh, a lot of material from alumni or the family alumni from, you know, of alumni. And it's always interesting to kind of see um, what comes back to us, that kind of history that that goes kind of starts here and then ultimately returns here. All right, just a, a kind of an also an idea of what we do with all this material. So as Stacy said, we don't like to see it gathering on, on dust on the shelf. We really use our material. We teach a lot of class sessions every semester, and you see in the slide um, students coming into our researcher room and actually getting their hands on this archival material, which is fascinating. Um, there's a a finding aid to the left for one of these classes. And also we do a lot of different kinds of just exhibits for classes and for different events. Um, so because we started as a woman's college in 1892, it, our, one of our original scopes that still is very prevalent is women's history. Um, so this is one of our big collecting strengths and our collecting areas, and this really is broad. So this includes history of women in the United States military, which is the Women Vets Project, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, women's suffrage, we have a lot of material on women's suffrage that includes camp suffrage on campus. We, it was very important to our students of that time. Um, American suffrage and British suffrage. A lot of uh, material we also have in different collections are women associated with UNCG history from the very beginning of the school to, to more current times. And this also kind of bleeds over to notable Greensboro women. So we do collect in the community and about the community. And so we have some great history of um, women in Greensboro. 19th and 20th century uh, Black women authors. We have a great collection of that. Women in higher education, again, bleeds over a little bit. Um, physical education, we were cutting edge um, school for physical education, still are, and we collect quite a bit of, about that. Um, again, kind of that community group with the Piedmont Triad, women's organizations, um, garden clubs, book clubs uh, are just a couple of examples. Uh, depiction of women in American culture, uh, sexuality and health, and women in book arts. So this is just a few of the things that we collect, but it's kind of all in that umbrella of women's history. 
Um, I want to particularly to talk about the Women Veterans Historical Project is a very important part of our department. Um, it is comprised of almost 800 smaller collections that include oral histories, photographs, uniforms, letters, diaries. It's um, it's absolutely incredible. It is kind of the scope is women in the military from about World War One to current conflicts. Um, it's an important collection. There's a huge online presence for it. We do an annual luncheon every year and quite a bit of of exhibits and teaching with this material. Um, just, uh, our curator is Beth Ann Kelsch. She is in the middle of those uh, reenactors to the left. It's one of my favorite pictures of her because um, she does a whole lot of, of outreach. And I just wanted to talk about oral histories. There are uh, this is a really big oral history collection kind of within the, the broader aspects of it and um, which which we we do use quite a bit is amazing to hear these women's stories from their with their own voice and this is Therese Stromer who to who's to the to the right who actually got her PhD here at UNCG um, Women's history also our scope kind of goes into rare books. As I mentioned, uh, we we kind of always had our early scope of collecting as women's collections. So we have some great things like women detective fiction, which is women who either wrote detective fiction or were the main protagonists. We have girls books in series, which includes, oh gosh, Nancy, the very earliest Nancy Drews, Bobsy Twins, and a lot of other series of girls books that you may not even have heard of. They were very, very popular at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. And Nancy Drew's first book actually came out in 1920. And uh, these would remain popular and, and expand. Also, we have a lot of home economic pamphlets and cookbooks, and um, those are amazing as well. So just a, a couple of examples of that on the screen. And to answer Christine's question, yes, I do believe we have Trixie Belden. Oh my goodness, we do. We have Trixie Belden. Christine, please come up and see our Trixie Beldens. Um, not only do we have some of these books, but in some cases, like especially Nancy Drew, we also have a company, a company uh, ephemera like Nancy Drew, board games, lunch boxes, paper dolls. So those are also great, especially in outreach for people to see not only their favorite books, but some of the things that they grew up with in their childhood. Um, just some formats that we include in our collections. Uh, we have published works. We have, of course, as I mentioned, organizational records, personal papers, but we also have wonderful textiles. Um, most of them are included in our university archives uh, collections, so they relate to the campus, like this class jacket uh, on the screen. Those students here were, were class jackets from about 1930 to 1973, and um, they are quite popular in exhibits and students always want to know why we cannot continue to have them. Uh, artifacts, again, oral history uh, interviews, which we have almost across all the collections. Scrapbooks have been very popular. We have over, gosh, I was thinking we had almost 400 scrapbooks between all our collections, and most of those are digitized. And posters and uh, lots of other ephemera. All right, so we owe our strengths in creative writing collections really to our fabulous English department because that collection is made up of <clears throat> the collections, the personal papers collections of faculty members as well as published students from that department as well as the master's uh, in um, fine arts in, in creative writing program. So these are examples of a few of the collections um, that we have. They um, are used frequently classes. I just used them yesterday or the day before or sometime this week. Um, and these uh, collections are manuscript collections that include uh, not only the correspondence and the news clippings, but mostly the drafts of um, these creative writers' works. So that way the students are able to track the creative process and see really how a novel or a short story or a piece of poetry is created. Within our creative writing collection, we have novelists, we have short story authors, we have poets, uh, we have children's books authors. Um, our English department has some produced some pretty amazing uh, writers. So this is uh, one of our, definitely one of our heaviest used collections. These are also really, really big collections. 
um, because uh, to create like one novel, you will have to do multiple drafts and then have those drafts created. So you end up with um, an author almost writing eight different books by the time they get to their final book. So this is this is a great collection. We also have concentrations in the visual arts and the performing arts, and the visual arts span a pretty good range. Um, these are the artist collections that are more traditionally of what you would think of as artist collections. So these are photographers, painters, um, sculptors. Uh, we have organizational records and a pottery collection. Lois Talinsky was a children's book author as well as a children's book illustrator. Um, so what we want to do with these types of collections is we're really tracking um, the artist's life. Um, so we always view a personal papers collection as kind of a biography of the creator of that collection, where every item within the collection, whether it's a sheet of paper or an, an object, um, represents a part of that artist's life. We focus less on the complete art, which is something you would typically see in a museum, and more on um, the the bits and pieces that make up a person's life. I'm going to put in chat an example of a digitized artist collection, uh, Maud Gatewood's collection. Um, there you can see some of the sketchbooks she had early in her career when she was an art student here. So you get to see the artists develop their technique and their own style, and that's something we love to see. We also have specimen collections such as the Jugtown Pottery Collection, um, which includes examples of Jugtown pottery that is a very heavily included uh, used collection. And of course, the photographer's collections usually contain a wide range of photography material within their own collection. And you can see um, the many times they took a picture before they settled on um, the one they actually wanted to show off. But we have all types of art in our collections, um, all different types of formats, not just the ones you would traditionally think of. So these are all derived from um, different collections. The first one is a Liberian um, ceremonial masks, and it actually came in um, as a collection of a former faculty member in the nutrition department. She went to Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 70s. Um, and she was teaching um, villages, but you know, primarily women about nutrition. Uh, and most of her, her collection actually um, is very women focused on uh, artifacts women would have had um, at that time in that place. But she has this beautiful um, mask that she shared with us. We also have um, multiple paper, we have multiple paper dresses. I think we have five and those are from an art on paper exhibit that was done at the Weatherspoon in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, these were art dress, these were dresses that were created by art faculty and then worn by docents um, during an event there. And then the Angela Davis piece, if it looks like a door to you, it's because it's a plywood covering of a door. Um, this piece is artwork created by a Greensboro artist, Amari Brown, and he was one of the artists who participated in the art that went on the plywood after the Black Lives Matters or during the Black Lives Matters protest after the murder of George Floyd. And it is part of our Black Lives Matters demonstrations and arts collection. Um, really, we were focused more on photo uh, photographing the art in its original state, which was primarily along Elm Street. Uh, but we did get a few pieces. Our students really love to interact with them. So we collect very broadly. Um, we co also collect very strongly in terms of what is going to be useful in instruction for the visual arts. Um, definitely one of our uh, cornerstone collections is our art books collection. And these are books that really um, defy what it means to physically be a book. So uh, these are books that are created by artists. They're in multiple formats. If you look at the picture on the right, um, the little thing that looks like a uh, bottle of medication, that's a book that's called Pharmacy of Crippling Hope. 
and uh, the pages are rolled in capsules that are then placed and each page has words on it. Um, so we love interacting, having students interact with this. It really gets the creative juices flowing. And a lot of these pieces are also created by women artists. So that's another tie back to our women's history focus. We also have strengths in um, book history in terms of printmaking, paper making, typography um, and samples and specimens representing um, the history of the book over the ages. So performing art. So um, once again, our, much like our creative writing collection, our dance collection is um, really we owe to the wealth of the faculty members and the students who have worked here. And these are just a few of the collections that we have. These are per primarily personal papers collections. So they're the um, the personal papers of these individual dancers, but they will also include professional papers, so maybe their research, it'll include the um, choreography of their work, uh, because most of these collections derive from our a dance program, the specialty and focus in the manuscripts collection reflects that. So we focus more on modern dance in the manuscripts collection, although we have ballet and more of the European historic dances represented in our rare books collection. So music is definitely has been a strength of ours for a long time. Um, and as the person who deals the most with music, I could easily spend this entire time talking about our music collections, but I won't. So what you're seeing on the screen are a few samples of different collections. The one on the left is from the Peter Paul Fuchs collection. Um, so with he's a composer and he was conductor of the Greensboro Symphony Orchestra and he um, our composer collections primarily focus on North Carolina composers or composers with some pre-existing tie to the collection. Um, so with this is why we have his collection. This piece actually he wrote based on random extracts from horoscopes he found in the newspaper. We've digitized a lot of his work. Um, there's a lot of international researchers who have been doing research on him, especially in Austria and um, Germany. The middle piece is from our Robert C. Hans of Performing Arts collection. I'm going to talk a bit about that uh, in later. This is um, a sampling of the popular American music uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century we have. We use that collection a great deal for um, discussion in classes about how music may reflect sexism, racism, nationalism. It's very easy material for students to use because you don't even have to be able to read music. You can read the lyrics. You can look at the art to get the picture. Some of the titles are pretty horrific. Um, so this is something we use a lot of in class. And of course, we as a university archives document the history of our school of music. So we have digitized almost all of the concert programs so you can actually see the performance career of our orchestra uh, and our School of Music students. This is a program from 1908. Um, so this is also a, a heavily used collection. But the collection that is near and dear to my heart, because it's where I started out, is the cello music collection. We have the largest archival collection of cello music in the world. Um, I don't believe Kathleen mentioned it, but we have the, also the largest academic archive devoted to American women veterans in the world. So those are two internationally, nationally known collections. So you may think that a cello music collection is very specific, and it is, um, but we use this very broadly. Um, it probably has our heaviest international research um, users with this collection, but we use it a lot in classes. Um, to give you some examples, on the left is a piece of annotated cello music, and this is what we want to see. The more written up, the better. Um, so this tells you physically what the cellist was doing, um, with their bows, with their fingers, their talent, giving insight on how they're choosing to play a piece of music. Um, 
So yes, Jenny, I got that email right before this. So um, actually, I have received emails today from um, a researcher in London and wherever your researcher is from. So it always sounds like I'm living a very exciting life, but they're just emails. Um, but I've received email. I've re helped researchers on every continent but Antarctica. So I'm hoping I get a Antarctic cellist someday. Um, but in terms, so obviously we use this a lot in the School of Music uh, classes, and there's a lot of researchers who are using this, but um, we use these cl collections in other classes because a lot of our cellists date to um, the World War II period, where many of them are coming or fleeing Europe um, during times of political upheaval, so they're political refugees. We have three Holocaust survivors represented in our collection, and one of the Holocaust survivors, Lev Aronson, um, his material actually has music that was written contemporaneous to the war. And um, the middle picture has Lev Aronson on the left um, of that. This is a celebration we did in conjunction with the School of Music or CVPA a while ago. Um, and his student, Lynn Harrell, um, Lynn Harrell was his early student and uh, a Grammy Award winning cellist whose collection we also have. Um, we, we brought Lynn Harrell in to celebrate with us. Um, so this historical tie to the events that are happening around the times these cellist or pieces of music exist is important. The piece on the right is <clears throat> a composition by Lev Aronson. He wrote in the American militarized zone of Berlin, <clears throat> this would have been after he escaped both the concentration camps and the Russian camps because he was a prisoner in both. And it is not signed with his name, but with his concentration camp number. So um, you, you have pieces like this, which, which really resonate with the students. And these are all pieces reflective of Jewish faith. Some of them are predating the war. Some of them were dated uh, date to the war. Um, so you have this music as historic artifacts, and we love incorporating that into classes. Um, and of course, theater, last but not least. So we have a really amazing um, the historic theater collection that was donated to us by Robert C. Hansen, who is a faculty member in the performing, in uh, the theater department here. We have many of the pieces digitized, and this is um, just such a wonderful uh, Ex um, collection for exhibits and for classes. So we have wardrobe design, set design, program scrapbooks, the cigarette cards, correspondence, um, a little bit of everything that involves American and some English theater pieces. Um, and this is just a one, it, I just cannot tell you how amazing this collection is. Um, we have this collection and we use this heavily. And as I said, the music is from this collection, but we also collect from the local and regional art, which kind of ties into other collections. So we have the collection of Triad Stage, excuse me, and we have multiple dioramas of their sets um, in addition to their papers. Uh, and we're actually, I think, going to work to digitize these. These are really awesome pieces. And if you exhibit, if you, uh, come to the library to the first floor by the reference desk. Um, right now, you can see an exhibit of the Livestock Playhouse, which is one of our local theater groups. So um, we and we have more than this. So we collect heavily for the local arts as much as as much as we can, really. And of course, local and regional history, local heart arts, and we move on to other topics. We have been expanding our holdings of African American local history, and to understand um, to understand this, you have to understand we're collecting within the context of having, I don't know, five historical African American history institutions near us, and we don't want to step on their toes of material that should go to them. So we kind of fill in the blanks within um, the historic record of our area. These are two very 
awesome collections we have. Alrita Alexander was the first African American woman to graduate from Columbia uh, University Law School and get her degree. She also was the first to practice law in North Carolina, and she was the first to be elected to the bench um, in the district court, in all of North Carolina in the district court. So she is an amazing woman. Um, there's a book actually that was recently um, released about her by a former faculty member, Jenny Sumi. Um, but we've digitized a lot of the material in her collection, and you'll probably be seeing some of that material in um, an upcoming exhibit we're doing around election season. We also have the Greensboro Massacre collection. This was the personal collection of Cindy Waller Foxworth. Her husband, Jim Waller, was one of the five who was um, killed during the massacre. We just received a grant to partner with Bennett College to digitize both our collection and the um, Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation collection at Bennett College. So um, we have started the digitization of that and that is there. And um, we also have many local business and philanthropic and charity groups digitized. Many of these are women's groups. Kathleen mentioned a little bit about this earlier. There's way more than this. So you can really get a very good snapshot of um, the growth and outreach in Greensboro. And finally, but one of my favorites, the Pride of the Community collection, we document the history, the local and regional history of the LGBTQ community. We actually had um, some of our material used on the news, local news last night. Um, so this collection includes uh, material that was submitted to the, by the community for us to digitize. It includes our own material and it includes some really fabulous um, oral histories. It also has a strong representation of UNCG's LGBTQ history. All of this can be found on Gateway, gateway.uncg.edu. Those are the um, related to the links that I've been sending out on chat through this entire presentation. It's a very easy place to lose time and browse through. I highly recommend doing that maybe on your lunch break or when you have time. Um, and we're happy to help you navigate through it if you need help. So if you have any questions or you have any ideas about maybe potential research projects for you or your class, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we also have a departmental email I'm going to put in chat, um, which is just skua.uncg.edu. Um, we work with faculty for their own research and students and classes um, throughout the year. So we love hearing for you from you. And if you didn't see something you may have been looking forward to for today, um, please reach out to us because we may have it. We could only talk about a very small number of, of collections today. Right. I wanted to add to that as well. And just what you said, Stacey, these these this focus was a collection of distinctions. So they were our particular um, kind of things that are standout collecting areas for us, but we do have a whole lot of other collections that are very interesting and fit well into um, the class, the coursework of the university. So um, please, you can you can find all of those on our website. All right, thank you so much, Stacy and Kathleen. That was great. Even having been here for so long, I feel like I always learn or I'm reminded of something new every time I hear y'all talk about the wonderful special collections. Are there any questions for Kathleen or Stacy? Everyone's lost in the links. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. A very, very impressive. Uh, keeping up with the links as you were going along, I must say. Um, well, please, if you have any questions, just let us know. You can um, contact us directly or uh, through the school website. Thank you so right. much, Anna. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Thanks, y'all. I hope you Thanks, have a great Anna. day. Thank y'all. You too. Bye.